Hi, this is Paul Schreiber from Synthesis Technology, and I'm here to welcome you to my next video in the $25 Patreon level, The Secrets of the Mini Verb 1. This video is free for everybody, but the next two are going to cost you $25 a month subscription. Video number two will be the hardware design of the MIDI verb. There's never been a schematic for it. It's been a closely held secret, but not anymore. The second video, we're going to cover the firmware inside the MIDI verb. Basically, what makes this MIDI verb run with a very small, off the shelf, custom DSP. It was pretty elaborate for 1986, and as you'll see, it's quite complicated. So I hope you'll be able to watch those videos in the future. They're going to come out at the end of June, and I hope to see you then. Oh, reverb. The most recognizable audio effect used in virtually every recording. But how do we get reverb? Like in a cathedral, in a choir and pipe organs, and later when the acoustics were figured out, in large concert halls all across Europe for symphonies and operas. Well, if we want that reverb effect in our recording, do we have to do it in a church? Well, some people did, like Tangerine Dream did in 1975 with the recording in Coventry Cathedral. But before that, the design engineers of recording studios would generally set aside the large main room to be their reverberant space. Like here's one at Capitol Records, also famously at Abbey Road Studios. And a lot of recordings were done in these large rooms, like Miles Davis's recording, Kind of Blue. They also found out that you can get interesting reverb effects that didn't sound like a church, but it was still reverberant if recorded in a certain space, like a stairwell, such as Led Zeppelin did with When the Levee Breaks. Or even in a bathroom, like Jim Morrison did for the vocals for L.A. Woman. LA Woman. Those were also impractical. It's hard to drag all your gear into the bathroom. So the engineers said, let's do a compromise. Let's make a standalone reverberant room where we don't want to put the players and their instruments, but we can record the audio going through that room and just mix it in. And that's what they did. Here's an example of a room at Capitol Records where the Beach Boys recorded Surfing USA. Across the USA. Now, how can we do this same reverb effect without using a physical acoustical space? It was designed by none other than Lawrence Hammond of Hammond Organ fame. Yes, he invented the spring reverb, although he kind of stole it from Bell Labs, but we won't go there. And he found out that if he could take a long enough spring, put a transducer at each end, and put a couple of springs in parallel with it, the sound electronically doesn't go through it, but they vibrate sympathetically, and you enclose it in a nice metal box, which we all call the reverb tank, you can get a pretty good sounding reverb. He kind of shot himself in the foot with the Leslie cabinet, and so everybody said, I don't want your tone cabinets, I want Leslie cabinet. So he did the smart thing. He marketed it to Fender, and Fender put it in the 1963 Vibroverb amplifier, and now the sound of a spring reverb was immediately associated not with the Hammond organ, but with guitar amplifiers, like Dick Dale doing his surf music. <laughs> In 1957, a company called EMT discovered they could make a reverberant sound not using metal springs, but a very large and heavy metal plate. They could attach transducers on the corners, suspend the plate in basically a shock mount like a microphone, and you could get the sound of a reverb. It was big. It was heavy. It was expensive. It was perfect for a recording studio. An example of an EMT plate recording is Pink Floyd's song Time off of Dark Side of the Moon. (music) 
EMT then came out in 1976 with the first true digital reverb called the EMT 250. It was $30,000. That's the price of two brand new Corvettes. It looked like it was designed by George Jetson. I think it's kind of cool. Look at those knobs and levers up there. But they were wiped out two years later by a bunch of upstarts from MIT in Boston, Massachusetts called Lexicon, who came out with the mathematical algorithms to make good sounding reverb. Now, they didn't invent the original digital reverb algorithm. That was done by a guy named M.R. Schroeder in 1963 when he published a paper going, I think this is how reverb works. The trouble was, he was only about 45% right. It didn't sound good. But Lexicon, through trial and error, found a little secret sauce to make digital reverb sound good. And that was the 224, 1978, $15,000, half the price of an EMT 250, and it was a huge success. Now let's fast forward about three or four years to the 80s. You had in 1981, the RMX 16 at $6,000. And in 1985, the flagship PCM 70 for $2,500, probably used on more records than any other single reverb ever made. But there was a guy at a guitar pedal company during this time, the early 80s, when he said, I think I can do it cheaper. And his name was Keith Barr, and the company was MXR. And now we're going to tell that story. MXR was formed in 1972 with Keith Barr and Terry Sherwood. Their first product was the famous orange pedal, the Phase 90. But Keith was really not into guitar pedals. He wanted to do a reverb. So Terry Sherwood took over the pedal development, and Keith went off in the back room and decided to make his own digital reverb, and he came out with it in 1984, and it was called the MXR-01. It cost $19.99. So it was $500 cheaper on MSRP than the Lexicon. It had 10 kilohertz bandwidth. It had about a 68 dB signal noise ratio. Let's just say that the reviewers were not kind. Keith then left to form Alesis. Now, most people know Alesis for the ADAT or maybe even the Andromeda, but Keith formed Alesis specifically to come out with a better improved MXR01, and he did in 1985 called the Alesis XT. Now, he made some compromises. It only has two algorithms, but he sold it for $7.99. So he went from $19.99 to $7.99. Now, the reviews initially were not very happy with the XT. They weren't kind, but Keith was smart. He listened to what the reviewer said. He changed the algorithm. He changed the faceplate. He now called it the XT.C, and he sold it for $7.49. He still wasn't happy. So he went off for an entire year and said, I'm going to make the world's cheapest reverb. So in 1986, Keith Barr announced for $499, the MIDI Verb 1, also called the MIDI FX. When you change the EEPROM, you can have effects. How was he able to do it for $499? Well, the first thing he did was no custom parts. Now you may read on the internet, that there's custom parts in there, entirely not true. As you'll find out in the second video, it's all standard TTL parts with an 8031 processor. He has no preamp in there. There's no guitar input. There's no mic input. It's a line level input, and it's not even on quarter inch or TRS. It's on RCA Fino jacks. I think he stole that from me on the MG1. It's not in a rack. It's not in a pedal, it's in a custom-made plastic box. But that combination, along with $499 retail, the thing was a huge success. He had something else in mind, something called the ADAT. So he handed over all the future development for the MIDI verb to an engineer named Alan Zach. And Alan Zach is the person who put the custom parts in the MIDI verb 2 and the quadra verb and the nano verb to make those products. Keith Barr then went off and designed the ADAT. And he did that pretty much the entire time he was at Alesis. Other products you may remember from that time period were designed by not an employee, but an outside consultant by the name of Marcus Ryle, who had just left Oberheim. 
and Marcus Ryle designed the MMT-8 MIDI sequencer and the HR-16 drum machine. Now let's take a look at a MIDI verb both inside and out. The first thing to notice, this uses probably the strangest, most bizarre wall wart I've ever seen. It's not DC. It's not strictly AC like we're used to in some older equipment. It's a center tapped 18 volt AC transformer. It doesn't even use a standard connector. It uses these Molex connectors and they're really easy to pull out. This unit is almost impossible to find on eBay coming with an adapter. I probably looked at 80 different MIDI verbs on eBay trying to find the best price and the best looking ones and I found exactly one that had the power supply with it. I personally think the Miniverb case is iconic. I love the way it looks. Although it's made of plastic, it used top grade, high impact ABS plastic. I couldn't find any information about who the industrial designer was for the Elisa's products. It could have been Keith Barr, but whoever designed this case knew exactly what they were doing. It's light, it's rugged, it's the perfect size, it, I think it looks great. I love the fact that they put the label on the top with all the algorithms. You really don't need a manual. In fact, this is probably the first piece of gear where the manual didn't even matter. It's easy to use. The UI is very simple. It's got rubber push buttons for essentially algorithm up and down and bypass. It has two LEDs, a green and a red for signal OK and signal clipping. And if you look at the algorithms, they're all in groups based on the algorithm like plate or room and the size of the reverb tail. And there's a little bit of variation in the tone quality called warm, bright, and dark. There's not a whole lot going on with MIDI. All you can do is change the patch. So you can't change any parameters. There's nothing in the MIDI verb that's variable at all except for the rear mix control. It's completely preset. Wow, this thing's totally packed. The thing that jumps out to me immediately is it looks like this is a double-sided board. Four-layer boards back in the 80s and the 90s were so expensive, nobody used them. And it took a lot of PC board layout skill to get this many parts on a double-sided board. And as we'll find out again in episode two, he went to a lot of effort to make this design fit in this form factor. Let's check and see what the different sections are. Well, whenever I try to repair or reverse engineer a piece of equipment, I always start with the power supply. And you can see clearly, this is the power supply section right here by the input connector. I don't see anything special, some diodes, some three terminal regulators, nothing springs to mind. Next to that, again, near the back jacks, you have the analog input section. This is going to be the data converter, the input filters, and the output filters. Now, in the early 80s, they didn't have codecs, and they didn't have analog speed A to D converters. You did everything with a DAC, which is this part right here, and something called a successive approximation register over here. So you can turn a DAC into an A to D by using the SAR, the successive approximation register. And we're going to cover this in detail in the next two episodes. Next to that are the filters. You can see they use nice film capacitors, standard op amps. I don't see anything going on here, anything special. They're probably simply Salon key filters. And now we're going to kind of go down and check out the digital. Well, first let's look at the microcontroller section, which is in the bottom corner here. It's an Intel 8031 standard microcontroller. There's an EEPROM that holds the code, clearly marked as the firmware. Next to that is another EEPROM, clearly marked, and that's going to hold the actual DSP code to run the algorithms. Again, the only thing that this processor does literally is it drives the display, check those buttons that we press. It may do the clipping or not, I don't know yet, and it's going to do the MIDI program change. Well, I hope you enjoyed my explanation of digital reverbs and where the Alesis MIDI verb fits into the timeline. We'll find out in the next two episodes, which are at the $25 level on my Patreon. Check the link below, where we're going to talk about how the hardware works. The schematic for the MIDI verb has never been published. There's no service manual, but we're going to give it to you. 
where we're going to explain how we got that schematic, how we verified it, and how the schematic implements a very simple 16-bit DSP. In the second video, we're going to talk about the firmware. What's inside this EEPROM? What kind of instructions does it take to make a reverb? How many instructions does it execute? How fast can it execute? And more importantly, just exactly how does reverb come out? Well, I hope you joined at the $25 level. Those videos will be released towards the end of June, and I hope to see you then.